I grew up in the Australian outback, the bush. The outback! For as long as I can remember, I've been connected to and fascinated by Mother Nature. I travel the globe seeking out the world's most beautiful and deadly species. I'm a wildlife rescuer, field expert and conservationist. I believe creating a better understanding of our natural world will in future help to protect it. Welcome to Corey's Wild World. This is the largest land mammal on the planet. The largest species of elephant has been recorded at 8,000 kilos. That's more than eight tonne. And with a shoulder height of four metres and a vertical reach of over 20 feet, they are a force to be reckoned with. That's a stop a five tonne elephant. This is my mate Rambo. He has a shoulder height of three metres and weighs in at a cool five tonne. He's an eating machine. Wow. There you go. Let's roll. Rambo is an Asian elephant, also known as an Indian elephant, Elephus maximus indicus, and the four species of Asian elephant are found in 11 countries throughout Southeast Asia. Come on, big fella, it's a bit hot today. Let's go for a bit of a swim, shall we? Come on. Elephants love the water and it's pretty much part of their daily routine, especially when it's nice and warm. Basically saying to him in Thai, let's go, let's go. Ugh. Come on, big Bathing with giants. Hey, big fella. <laughs> That's five ton of bum scratching there. Against the rock. <laughs> oh, is that good, is it? Is that good? I like that big fella. <laughs> oh, here we go, another scratch. He's having a good time. Bathing and wallowing in the mud are important factors in the daily lives of elephants. It is vital that elephants regulate their temperature and rolling in the mud or blowing dirt onto wet skin acts as a natural sunblock, which also keeps the elephant cool. Plus it's fun. Oh, he likes a bath. Is that good, is it? Eh? Where's mine? Do I get a bit of a swim as well? Eh? <laughs> I don't want to stay off too long in case he decides to go.
he's got and this guy here is right tusked you can see that his tusk is worn down a little bit more they also have big grinding molars about the size of my fist and because they eat about 250 kilos a day they need to grind a lot of food up now he only digests 40 percent of what he eats that's why they need to eat so much where are we going are you just playing are you What's he doing? Where are we going, are we? Lay low, lay low. It's amazing for such a massive animal how quiet they actually walk. Very soft padded feet. So the gestation period for a female elephant is about 22 months. That's the longest of any mammal. Not very often, but rarely they will have twins. And when that baby elephant's born, if it's an Asian elephant, it's really, really hairy. He's got lots of little fuzz balls on him. They weigh 120, 100 to 120 kilos when they're born, the day that they're born. They're actually about a meter high. So they're just high enough to reach the teats of the mother. Elephant calf will actually drink up to 11 litres of milk in a day and grow a kilo a day. The males become sexually mature at about the age of 14. The female usually has her first calf at the age of 13. Sure, sure, sure. Sure, sure. Good boy. <laughs> so basically, the, uh, the family of elephants is made up mainly of the females. See you later. And the males usually leave when they're about 14 years old and they'll go and search for other groups of females when they become sexually mature. Wow, that's pretty cool, five ton elephant. Let's go and see what else we can find. Chang and the elephants behind because we're off to Cambodia. So we headed southeast along the tropical coast to the Thailand Cambodia border crossing. Cambodian border, it's uh, passport time, so let's go. Hello, people, hi. <laughs> All right, there we go. One ticket to Cambodia, one month visa, let's roll. to Sinukville. We've traveled about four hours southeast from the border and uh, let's have a look at this place. This is one of the most interesting restaurants you'll ever visit. The Snake House is a unique resort in Sinukville, Cambodia, which hosts a range of species in its own wildlife park. 
The Snake House is also one of the few places in southern Cambodia that assists with snake bite victims and has successfully saved lives. The Snake House. Sounds like my type of place. This is Mr. John, how are you? Hi. And your brother, Mr. Tulsa, how are you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. These guys work at the snake house and their daily duties are basically to roam around and look after the animals. We've got one down here, we have got a bit of a snake, let's have a look at him, shall we? This one's called a Malayan pit viper. And you can see his camouflage is really good and he's a short, fat, stumpy snake. Got a strike there. There he is, have a look at him. You can see the angle of that head, his nose is pointed up. He's a hinged fang snake, very similar to rattlesnakes, bushmaster. And what he does is he sits in the leaves in an ambush position, and you can see he's got a short little stumpy tail here. And what he'll do is he'll put the tail near his head and he'll wiggle it around just like a worm and a lizard or something will come over see that tail and then he'll go whack i'll give you a bit of a look at those fangs there have a look at that they're big fangs aren't they just over 10 mil long and he's he's got a he's got a pretty toxic bite he's potentially fatal might see if we can give you a bit of a look at his venom Have a look at that, look at those fangs. That venom going in the glass there. Extremely potent venom. You wouldn't want to get tagged by this guy. If he bit me now, I'd be in real trouble. Even after being milked, a small amount of venom there, that is enough to kill a human without a doubt. There, there's his little tail. He'll wriggle it around like a worm to attract lizards, frogs, rodents, whatever comes and has a look at it, and he'll go wacko. The thing that makes these snakes dangerous is a lot of the time they try to rely on their camouflage. So when you're walking around, they would rather try and stay still than actually move out of your way. So that's what makes them dangerous. Another thing with these pit viper snakes, the reason he's called a pit viper is just in front of his eye, he has a pit and it picks up even a tenth of degree temperature change. So if I blow near him, there we go. That's what happens. Oh, while we got him here, let's just have a quick look at that heat sensing pit. You can see it just in front of his eye there. A tiny little hole, and that helps him hunt because he is nocturnal. So he can basically sit there in the leaves and just wait for a temperature change strike and usually it's dinner. Hello. How are you? Have a look at this. This is an albinistic Burmese python. Molorus bivitus. An albinistic is basically albino. She's got pink eyes. They're found throughout Southeast Asia. They have been known to eat the odd person once they get to the huge size. Beautiful snake, have a look at it. Did you know that the Burmese python holds the world record for the heaviest snake in captivity? It weighs a massive 183 kilos and is over eight meters in length. And it lives in the US. These snakes are also found in Sumba and the Sulawesi. And if you have a close look, just on the top of the head there, on the upper jaw, that's where heat sensing pits are, those pits in the face. And of course they detect the heat of their prey. They are nocturnal animals. Now she lacks venom, they kill by constriction. But in that mouth there, she's got over 50 teeth.
woken up this cobra so he's pretty active. <laughs> They're mainly nocturnal, especially in the summertime. So in the late afternoons when he's waking up he's ready to go hunting. Don't you mate, hey? I'm tricky, I can actually touch him on the back of the head like Ooh. Ooh. Beautiful snake, have a look at the colour. White snake. Love it. I love these guys. Such beautiful intelligent snakes. Ooh. Ooh. Now what he's doing is basically there's a predator, something here big enough to eat him. So what he'll do is he stand his ground because he doesn't feel comfortable. If I stand up and move away, what he'll do is once I'm out of distance, then he'll go on his way. He doesn't really want a confrontation. But as long as I'm in his strike zone or his territory, he'll defend it as best he can. Hey, mate. Now cobras, monosolate cobras strike downwards, as you can see he just did before. For them to strike upwards is very hard. So I can pin him down, he can't see my hand. Ooh! Nice and close. Now I wouldn't recommend anybody trying to do this, especially with a cobra, but I'll give you a demonstration on how to catch one. So he's only got little fangs, he's a front fang snake, but the venom from this snake is potentially fatal and they're probably number two for human fatalities in Asia. You can see just there, but ooh, they, take, they pack a punch and he bites hard. Okay, now he's settled down a little bit. Look at that. Settled down, he's realised that I'm not going to eat him. And he's allowed me the privilege to free handle him. Gently, gently. We're just going to uh, show you the difference between a white monosolate cobra and a normal patterned one, normal colour. Oh, hello. Have a look at this guy. What you doing in there? Hey? Monosolate cobra. Come on, buddy. You're going to have to come out of there. Ooh. Ooh. Have a try from this side. Oh, danger, danger. Ooh. Ooh. Come on, come on. So 
want to reverse up in there. Oh, I've got your tail now. Now you can see he's flaring his neck out like that, making himself look big and scary. Monocle Cobra, you can see the light monocle on the back of his neck. Don't try this at home. Kiss the cobra. There's the monocle on the back of his neck. Have a look at this naughty little snake here. There's a Russell's Viper. Siamese Russell's Viper. We're gonna see if we can get a couple of shots of him. You can hear him hissing. So he's in the strike position there. He's loaded up, curling up. These things have got a great strike range. And he's got huge fangs with a lot of venom. These snakes have terrible venom. If this thing bites you, you're gonna clot up. It's gonna kill all your blood cells, the walls of your veins. It's gonna make you internally bleed and hemorrhage. And if not treated, you'll certainly die from a bite from this snake. The thing about the Russell's Viper is if you are walking through the bush and you send out vibrations, he'll hear them and he'll hiss like that. So that hissing, with a bit of luck, you'll hear it and he'll warn you that he's there. Because usually he relies on his camouflage and he'll stay where he is. So if you're walking in territory where there's vipers or death adders, rattlesnakes, best to wear jeans and boots. Beautiful snake. Well guys, it's time to leave Sinookville. We're gonna head north up to Kampong. Kampong Tong. <laughs> the spider village, let's go. This is where it all happens. This is the village of Sukun. And all the spiders from the surrounding areas are bought here to be fried and unfortunately sold to the tourists. So we'll have a look. We should see some cars pulling up shortly to buy some spiders and other insects.
Thanks for today. What is this? Oh my god, look at all those spiders. The poor little things have been fried up. So this is the last stop for those poor tarantulas. You can see there. Now they sell these here on the side of the road. I think you get about 15 or 15 or so for a dollar. So not very much money at all. Through thousands of spiders every week, if not tens of thousands. And especially the big females like this one here, they're the ones we want to get and relocate back into the wild. You eat, you eat. Eat, you eat. Oh, oh. Oh, look what we got here. Look at all these crickets. Oh my God, there must be 6,000 in there. And what they actually do is they send all the kids out at night time. They go under the lights and they catch all of these crickets, the average garden crickets, and then they fry them up in the morning fresh and sell them to the tourists. Isn't that right? Are you going to eat one? You want to eat one? <laughs> I prefer mine alive, so I'm not going to eat these guys anyway. Hello. Suk sabai. Suk sabai de. Sabai sabai de. What is this? Hello. Oh, have a look at this. Well, if crickets and spiders weren't your fancy, look what we've got here. These are stuffed frogs. They've stuffed them. I think they've got some garlic and things, and they take their heads off. Mmm, yummy, yummy. This is Mr. Sook. He's going to show us some spider holes, aren't you? Yes. Sir. Okay, let's go let's for go. ping. It's not a real big one, it's probably, uh, the spider would be a little bit smaller than the size of my hand. And you can see he's got a bit of a web across the front there. What they do, because they're nocturnal, during the day they sleep and they'll put a small web over the front to stop any other ants and things invading their territory, especially when they have eggs. So there's a tarantula hole there. Ah, so these are the spider holes that the Cambodian people dig out and they collect the spiders here yeah? and then they take to the village and they cook them and then they sell to the tourists where people come past with their cars and they stop and they buy the tarantulas and they eat them here yeah? and this has been going on for generations. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll go into town and we'll have a look at some of the spiders that they're selling. Oh, Akun. Thank you, thank you. Yes. 
If you ever do go out trekking around in Cambodia, make sure you have a local person with you because you never know, there's still more than four million landmines throughout this country, so best to be safe than sorry. where they collect all of the spiders, they come to this area and then what they do is they sell them out from here. You can see there's a lot there, a lot of tarantulas. And some are mature breeding females like this one here. So these are the ones we want to get and we'll release back into the wild. We've got our camera case here, this will do the job. So what we want to do is put the uh, big, 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 Look at that, that's amazing. Look how placid they are. People with arachnophobia? Forget it. Look at these guys. There we go, we got some spiders there. <laughs> okay, here we are. We've got our spiders which we bought from town. And these are the females. The females have the larger abdomen and on the back there, there are two small slits. It's uh, hard to see. Just in here. And the male spiders on their front two pedipalps here have sperm sacs. So that's the way you tell the difference between the males and the females. And uh, these spiders can live up to 10 years, 10 years of age. Okay, well we've got our female spiders and what we've come to a secluded area, nice cool afternoon, late afternoon, It'll be getting dark soon, so what they should be able to do is find their own homes around this area. We will relocate these spiders into separate areas around 10 to 20 metres apart because they do have a territory once they establish their home. And hopefully there's some males roaming around which will come and find them as we like to relocate as much wildlife as we can and preserve it. These guys here play a major role in the ecosystem of arthropods and insects. We're expecting some rain too this afternoon, so that'll be really good for the spiders. It'll soften the ground up and they'll be able to dig out their new homes. Okay, here we go. Bamboo stuff's great. Lots of lo lots of loose leaves. What a beautiful spider. Have a look at the pattern on that. There you go. Find somewhere in there. 
That storm's coming right on time. I haven't got my watch on, but it's right on time. Okay, this is our last tarantula. Let's release her into some thick foliage here. Hopefully tonight she can wander around and get herself something to eat. There we go. There you go, darling. Bye-bye. See you later. Oh, wow, what a great feeling releasing such beautiful big spiders back into a natural environment. Saved them from the walk. These females can have more than 150 offspring per year, so that's really good. Hopefully they'll thrive in this area. Stay tuned. Well, we've explored Siem Reap, Cambodia. Let's cross the border and see what Vietnam has in store. Welcome to the spectacular sand dunes of Mui Ne. We're in Vietnam, about 240 kilometres northeast of Saigon. And we've come to this area to see what we can find, what sort of reptiles or animals that would live here. It's hard to believe in such a harsh environment things are able to survive, but they are. And in areas like this, have a look, we've got some tracks around here. It's got the tail and it's got the little footprints on either side coming into the bushes, into these holes here. So I'd say that'd be uh, some type of lizard hole, probably a skink or a small dragon. like a little oasis in the middle of the desert. Got these beautiful lotus flowers here. Oh, well, the water's nice and clean. There's a few fish around. Believe it or not, there's some really big frogs in here as well. Oh, that's nice. I might have to have a swim in that later. This oasis, or billabong as we like to call them in Australia, are the heart and life support of a range of creatures that live here. Without these mini ecosystems, many species would perish. This looks promising. It's a bit of a hole in here, I don't know, it could be uh, a number of things. Uh, usually reptiles, especially the, the lizards, when it gets hot during the day, they'll come into, into their burrows and they'll burrow right down into the ground to where it's nice and cool to escape the heat of the day and also escape predators. They can also escape fire. Oh, there he goes! <laughs> Beautiful little lizard. Great colours. This is just a juvenile. They get to about whew, 50, 60 centimetres in length. He flew out his hole, didn't he? Straight between the cameraman's legs. <laughs> Ok, 
straight out of the hole. Let's pop him back in there where he belongs, where it's nice and cool. There you go, matey. There he goes, down where it's nice and cool. Let's go and explore some other areas of these fantastic white sand. Isn't he spectacular? He's a blue crested forest dragon. I'm gonna have to take a couple photos of this guy. Have a look at the blue color. That's fantastic. So these guys are from the Agamid family and they're basically small dragons. Oh, where you going little fella? And they're found in lots and lots of areas. They eat beetles. And what they do is when they lay their eggs, the females will dig a hole and then she'll lay her eggs in there. Uh, seven to 12 eggs and then she'll cover the hole up of all traces so predators can't find them. So I'll try and get her. You're a handsome little man, aren't you? Now what he's actually doing is he's right up on the top of the branches. He's got all his mating colours and he'll bob his head and give other signals to protect his territory and also entice the girls over. Have a look at me, check out my nice blue suit. <laughs> but usually in, when it's not mating season, these guys are a fairly dull drab colour which they use for camouflage. So Sometimes it works for him to get the ladies, other times it works against him when predators see those bright colours. This hole's a bit bigger. You can see we've got a bit of a, a tail slide going into the hole. It's getting around lunchtime now, so anything out in, this, in the sun, including me, I'm looking a little bit red, <laughs> wants to get underground where it's nice and cool, so. I hope it's a lizard in here. You never know, sometimes a snake might go in there and eat the lizard and then move into his home, so. Another butterfly lizard. I think it's a butterfly lizard. I saw his tail. But what he's actually doing is I'm digging in and he's digging further, further in to get away from me. This one's a bit bigger. See the dirt coming out? <laughs> All right, let's reach in and grab him, shall we? If we grab him before he grabs me, big fella. I have to get him up around the back legs. I don't want to pull him out by the tail. Come on, come on. Oh yeah, he's a bit bigger, this fella. Oh, hello. Hello, how are you going? What a handsome devil. Look at this lizard, spectacular. He's got blue, red, black, spots, stripes. No wonder you get all the girls. Hey, have a look at his back legs. Look at the toes there, look how long they are. That helps him run fast and also helps him dig. You can see his front claws here and that, that's what he was digging with just then. He's got like a short stumpy head. Now these lizards are omnivorous. So they eat uh, vegetation as well as insects. Wow, spectacular. 
He's got a flat tail, very long. You have a close look in his ear there, you can see the drum. And that keeps sand out while he's burrowing. Now the males, this is looks like a male to me, he's got the, the, all the breeding colours. And when they mate, the female will lay the eggs down the burrow and the babies will hatch out. And then they'll live in the burrow with mum for up to seven months. So you can see he's a very solid, stocky, stocky lizard. Handsome. You're so handsome, aren't you? Just want to give you a little kiss. Okay, we're going to put him on the ground and give you a demonstration of how fast he can run. We'll see if I can keep up. Are you ready? On your marks, get set, go. The marathon runner. Here we go, mate. We'll pop you back in his hole. Go in there where it's nice and cool. And what he'll do is he'll dig that out further, get in there and enjoy the rest of his day. Later on in the afternoon, come out and look for some green things to eat, flowers, buds, also insects, and whatever else is around. Let's go. Wow, leaping lizards. This is the sand dunes of Muine. We hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Now I have to get out of here because I'm starting to look like a prawn on the barbie. But uh, join us, our next destination. I've got no idea where it is, but we'll see you when we get there. Let's follow the ducks, they seem to know where they're going. Feels a little bit creepy feeling along the bottom. It's a nice time of the day for a swim, but what I'm actually doing is looking for a certain species of snake that lives in the water around this area. So I'll feel around a bit more and let's see what we can find or see what can find me. This is what we've been looking for and I've been feeling around with my feet because he's got really coarse skin. That's why he's called a file snake. But here in Thailand they call him an elephant trunk snake because the species found here can actually grow to 2.9 meters. Nearly 3 meters in length. There's another species of them which is found all the way down right down to Australia also called a file snake, but he only grows to about a metre in length. Now these big females, once they get large enough, they can actually have up to 40 young at a time. And he's got really coarse, coarse scales, very much like a file. He doesn't have lateral scales on the bottom. And what he does is he grabs his fish and he wraps around them and these coarse scales help him to hang on to them. Also frogs and other slippery aquatic animals. You can see his forked tongue there is coming out. It's quite long the forked tongue of this snake and he'll use that underneath the water also. He'll use that, he can taste the particles in the water, he can taste where the fish are. There we go. 
And now if you have a look at his eyes there, you can see his eyes. Whoop, I'll get his head to stay still. His, his head's very flat and the eyes are close to the top of his head. So he can just stick the, his nostrils and his eyes out of the water. Now this snake can stay in the water for a long periods of time while he's hunting. Wow, amazing snake. Hey, right, bye bye, see ya. Places like this, chickens, ducks, poultry, grains and rice, you're going to find rats and rodents. Where rats and rodents live, you also find snakes usually. We're in a village in northern Thailand and we've come to have a bit of a look around to see if they've got any snakes in the area. You never know where they're going to be. Oh, come over here, come over here. Oh, have a look at that. Wow, just looks, looks just like a brown snake from Australia. But it's not. Now the name for the common brown snake in Australia, or Eastern Brown, is actually Pseudo Naja, which means false cobra, because the brown snake also stands up a little bit like that. He doesn't have the hood, but... Wow, what a beauty. Okay, what we'll do is we'll, we'll try and get a hold of him before he gets hold of me and we'll take him over to this clearing over here. Give you guys a bit better look. Whoa, what a beauty. Have a look at that. Oh, this is the equatorial spitting cobra and these snakes have evolved to spit venom up to two meters or oh, sometimes further, but he'll also bite as well, as you just demonstrated. Oh, wow, he's quick. What a magnificent hood he has. Oh, that's a lovely shot. These snakes lay up to 23 eggs and they're found throughout Southeast Asia. You get some nice shots of this snake. See that pattern on the back of his neck? Ooh, that was a little bit too close for comfort there, buddy. hear that hissing noise, he's hissing warning, stay away from me, I'm big and angry, and I've got toxic venom, and that he has. A neurotoxic venom which attacks the central nervous system, causing paralysis. Well, that's a nice shot. Bit of greenery in the background. Down nice and, nice and low as well, so you get a bit of scenery in the shot. Safety glasses on also, just in case. Get a hold of him like that. They don't have the big hinge fangs like the, the vipers do, but they pack a good punch. There we go.
Wow, absolutely incredible. We've been on walkabout in Cambodia now for quite some time and I haven't seen anything like this. King Suravarman II in the 12th century and it's mainly made of limestone. The term Angkor means city and Wat is temple. Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat is not only a structural masterpiece but also you can see on the walls different carvings each tell a different story and in the north, east, south, west faces of each side of the building has a different story and magnificent stone carving. geckos, flat-tailed geckos and microbats are just some of the wildlife that also live inside these temples. You can see that most of the temples are made from sandstone, also laterite and occasionally granite. What they've done here is on the inside they've used basalt which is a volcanic porous rock as the main structure and then they've used the sandstone on the outside to disguise these rocks. This is an area where some of the outer sandstone rocks have fallen away so very clever. Sometimes you can even find monkeys in the temples. Long tail macaques. Obviously, long tail by name, long tail by nature. There are more than five species of macaque found throughout Southeast Asia. And they are found in family groups of up to 70 individuals. That's a big troop, isn't it? They're really good swimmers. They've been known to dive into the water and catch crabs. They like to hang out in areas around large rivers. They will venture into town also. They're omnivorous. They eat insects as well as vegetation and fruits. The females have one baby after a gestation period of about six months. This is the main Buddha image of Angkor Wat and this is where the people come to pray. Usually for good luck, health and prosperity, they'll come and light some incense and some candles for Buddha. Wow, that was Angkor Wat. Now we're going to go and check out the jungle temple. Dum -dum. Shall we? Okay, we've got some monkeys here. Look, they're long tailed macaques. Unfortunately, the mum's missing her hand by the looks. You'll notice one thing with these monkeys if you do stare them in the eyes, sometimes they see it as an insult. They can see the little baby and the mum. Whoop, whoop. Here comes mum. There comes dad. <laughs> sometimes when they've got little ones, they get a bit cranky. You've got to watch out for that. Ha <laughs> ha. 
<laughs> That's enough monkey business for one day. Got to look out, they've got big canine teeth. Anyway, to the temple. the ancient temple of Tapong. Let's go. As you can see, this temple's basically been left in its original state and the rainforest has grown around it. You can see greens in the rocks from the mosses and the lichens and also the fig trees and the cotton silk trees, which basically overgrown the temple. Some of the roots are going in between the blocks and splitting the blocks apart. As you can see these blocks up here, they're actually just stacked on top of each other like Lego. Now they didn't have concrete back in those days, but what they did use to use is certain types of sap. Uh, another reason for them actually crumbling is the sap's worn away and the blocks come loose as well as with the strangler trees. If you have a look over here, you can see in most of these blocks, they're one piece, one big block. And they've put holes in them here and they've used a hooking system and bamboo and dragged them from the elephant mountains as far as 30 kilometers away to this area, block by block. Uh, elephants should be able to drag maybe seven or eight blocks, depending on the size and the weight of them. So. It would have taken a long, long time. Wow, check out the size of these trees. All the way up the top there. These ones are cotton silk trees. Always on the lookout for some snakes and bats and other creepy crawlies that might be hiding. <laughs> Check that out, that's a big strangler fig tree. And what they are is an epiphyte. Uh, they throw it around as a spore in the rainforest and they'll attach themselves to something moist, whether it be a building or another tree, and they'll grow from there. Now what it actually does is a tree grows up and it sends its roots down to the ground and then it picks up the moisture from the ground. It will spread all its leaves out at the top. If it's on a host tree, it'll eventually overgrow the host tree take all of its water and steal all of, it, all of its light and the host tree will eventually be strangled and the fig tree will be remaining. In this instance, this one's just started growing on the rocks and I'd say that tree there would be about 200 to 250 years old. It's a beauty. State of the art music studio. We've got our sound effects band with us. <laughs> Wow, this 
place is unbelievable. <laughs> I just feel like Indiana Jones. This place is amazing. Trekking around the bush looking for the largest species of venomous snake in the world is not everybody's cup of tea. Sometimes I wonder whether it's mine or not. A big part of me would love to find a couple of snakes and another part of me would be quite happy to not find any at all. That part's probably common sense. Big one, it's a big one. Get back just a little bit, just, just in case. I don't know where its head is. Oh, he's moving. I can't believe the size of this snake. Oh, wow. We'll bring him out here where he can have a look. Whoa, what a beauty. That's a big snake. This is the king, and you can see why he's the king of all snakes. Have a look at the size of him. Oh, hey big fella. You gonna stand up for us? <laughs> what a monster. That's unbelievable. Wow, this thing can move for a big snake. It moves fairly fast. Have a look at that. That's awesome. Look into the eyes of a snake this big and this fearsome. This snake is feared by more men than any other snake I know. He's like the white pointer of the land. Look at that face. Highly intelligent, you can see he's just Following my movement, he's got his mouth open, warning. If you come too close, I'm gonna bite you. His venom's a neurotoxic. It can kill a full-grown Asian elephant in three hours. A bite from a snake this size. Woo! We're gonna take you into the open. Can we do that? Oh, that's a no, I think. What a specimen. Look at that gaping mouth. To look at that in the eyes, something, something else. Another reason why he is the king of all snakes, not just because of his size, but he actually eats other snakes. Whoa. Yeah. 
Now, trying to get a bit of a guesstimate of how long he is. I'd say, whew, I'd say he would be over 12 feet. We'll just unwind him a little bit. Now this snake can grow up to 18 and a half feet. Now he's gonna give us a bit of a demonstration for just how long he actually is. Come over here, buddy. Show the viewers at home what the king cobra is all about. <laughs> now he doesn't actually like the direct sunlight. That's why he's moving into the shade. These snakes primarily hunt in the early morning, late afternoon, when it's a bit cooler for them. Have a look at these scales. They're huge, they're nearly as big as my fingernail. Now what I'm doing here is just moving. A lot of people when they see the snake shows in India where they have the flute, the, the snake can't actually hear the music, but what the snake does is follows the movement of the flute and also the guy will tap his foot and the snake will pick up the vibrations. Now if we can get him to open his mouth, you see in the mouth there's a, a round tube. That tube is his windpipe. Now when snakes swallow large prey items, that windpipe will actually hang out from the bottom jaw, allowing him to breathe while he swallows down his large prey, which can be up to 10 times the size of his head. Now I think I might leave this snake on the ground. <laughs> Could be a wise choice. I'd rather leave him on the ground than pick him up and uh, have the chance of me going to sleep permanently. Now, he is highly a neurotoxic. Oh, that was too close for comfort. A bite from this snake could take out up to 13 people. That's a lot of venom. That's enough to take out a cricket team. Serious stuff. Remember, don't try this at home. I'm Corey Wilde, catch you next time.